It's good to have a fairy princess here in the church with you. <laughs> she does her well, doesn't she? <laughs> You're fired. Get out. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> All right. There's a lot of different explanations for Matthew 11, verse 12. It says, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. But I want to I want to try to see this in context, because uh, it's talking about John the Baptist in this very scripture, and it was talking about John the Baptist before, and in fact, the subject was John the Baptist, and the subject was, uh, a, began with John the Baptist not really understanding um, not really understanding his dilemma or his situation, which was what? He's in prison. And Jesus is not going to free him from prison. He will die there. He will have his head cut off. And, um, but he doesn't know that. And more importantly, he knows Jesus has the power. Jesus has the power. So he's, he's going to use that power to free me from violence. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. Um, the flow of this, of this, everything up to this point, because that begins literally with uh, um, verse 2 of 11, all the way down, it's talked about John, and John and Jesus' place, their place is death, and it will be through violence, okay? Um, and we know that there's a difference between John's death and Jesus' death. We know that there's nothing atoning about Jesus, uh, John's death. We know that we bear about in our bodies the dying of the Lord Jesus, and we know that there's nothing atoning about that. There's only, that's only in what Jesus has done. <clears throat> but on the other hand, we also must realize that to bear about the dying of the Lord Jesus in our mortal bodies is not us going through it. It's him. We're bearing about his dying. We're not just, in that case, bearing about sufferings. Because you mention that, and then people go, well, you know, I mean, I, I remember in a generation back when the, when the people, when I was young, and they'd say, well, you know, my, my sick grandmother's my cross. You know, that was, the, that, was the, that was, you know, whatever trouble you're having, my arthritis must, is just my cross. No, it's not. It's not your cross. The cross is the cross of Christ. And, um, and it's not just, you know, and that's not suffering with Christ because everybody's got a grandmother. Anyway, I'm, just, I'm, I, I'm teasing. Uh, I don't want to offend any grandmothers here. Um, But you do know you're getting older when the little gray-haired woman you help across the street is your wife. That's when you know you're getting older. <laughs> well, she didn't have gray hair. What are we talking about? Yeah. All right. Uh, so verse 13 for all, for all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. Um, and so, you know, I don't, I don't really see, I mean, in a sense that we can say that from John and Jesus coming, the law stopped. But in truth... The law didn't stop until the cross. But they were bridging that gap. John was the forerunner for Jesus. 
and Jesus was the one whose death counted. So uh, let me, let's see. Well, verse 14. And if you will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. This is Elijah. So I wrote, this is not one of the weak that God honors. John is not one of the weak that God honors in the sense of what we call honors. He honors him by saving him, uh, but is chosen to enter death and to give himself. He's chosen for that. Verse 15, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Can you hear the difference between um, uh, God, um, God ministering to the weak, Jesus coming and hanging out with the outcasts and the Republicans and sinners? <laughs> which would be me, I'm a Republican. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm glad Jesus is hanging out with us, okay? <laughs> and so, um, this, this is his modus operandi. This is the way Jesus operated. This is the way that he was the whole time. And, so uh, this whole thing comes up with John, and John is confused, and John is wondering why he's not, you know, Jesus is doing miracles, and he's doing stuff for people in need, and why he's not helping John. And Jesus, through this process, has basically tried to communicate, John, you're my forerunner. You're supposed to be at a different place. You're supposed to be with me. They're not with me. They are benefactors of uh, our, our walk and our belief and our wisdom that is justified of her children and um, the the approach that we have in this um, and so then he ends it with he look you know if you have ears to hear this is what I'm talking about now we're about to move into something and you can see how that fits basically with uh, Matthew 11 25 through 27 where he says oh father you've chosen to hide these things from the wise and prudent but da 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 see we're coming we're going to come back to that but there's yet another portion in here and it begins with verse 16 <clears throat> but whereunto shall I like in this generation okay it is like un like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows and saying we have piped unto you and you have not danced we have mourned unto you, and you have not lamented. Okay, so he's referring that. To, he still hadn't left John. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he hath a, de a devil. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber and a friend of publicans and sinners, but wisdom is justified of her children. See, they're, they're accusing him of hanging out with the worst people, the weak people, the rejects, the da-da-da-da. If you're somebody, you hang out with somebodies. And this is, this is the wisdom of the world. This is what you do. If you want, you know, if you want to, be, if you want to become um, influential for Jesus, then build a great big church, become popular, become famous, you know, and make this big splash and do all of this stuff. And that way you'll be more influential for Jesus. No, no, you won't. You won't. That's not what he's like. So then some little pastor in some little town you never heard of that has three people, he's ministering to them, but he's laying down his life and he is living in weakness and, and embracing death that they might have life. And we go, well, he's nothing. He's nobody. Well, brother so-and-so came to, you know, came to the pastor meeting. And every time he tried to speak, somebody that's more important would speak over the top of him or, you know. 
a story that I've told over the years was about, uh, <clears throat> about uh, it was a big banquet that they were having in Hollywood. And so they had invited a whole bunch of celebrities and famous people and, uh, and somebody had invited a little known, little bitty pastor of a little bitty church to come and to just, you know, pray over the meal because it was a, a banquet. And then he, he could leave and stuff like that. And so the announcer, you know, got ready and he said, uh, well, we've got this uh, pastor so-and-so and his clothes were not, didn't match, you know, all the celebrities and stuff like that. We got pastor so-and-so and, and um, um, would, would you come up here and pray? So he walked up here and the, the announcer said, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I, I, uh, I used to be able to quote uh, Psalm 23. And um, so he just kind of looked out and said, any, any of you guys here know how to quote Psalm, the 23rd Psalm? And one very famous guy raises his hands. He says, I know how to quote it. And he walks up there, and the pastor steps back out of the way, and he starts off and goes, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He, and he uses all of his abilities as an actor to, to get it across. And when he got through the place, just burst out clapping for this celebrity who knew the whole 23rd Psalm. And so the, the announcer turns to the pastor and says, can you quote the whole thing? Almost like making fun of him. He gets up there and he quotes it. And when he gets through, there's not a dry eye in the place. And the announcer walks up after he says it and he says, the so-and-so, the famous guy, he knows the shepherd psalm, but pastor so-and-so knows the shepherd. You know, we are so, you know, we're just trying to gain something that's not really worth anything, but it, it is, it, 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 it seems to be worth something to people who are after that kind of thing or respect that kind of thing. When God looks at that, that old pastor and his clothes that may not be bad, but they don't match up to everybody else there. And he says, That's, that belongs to me right there. He knows me. He knows me. And we pursue things that, that will kill us, kill our true spiritual relationship with the Lord. We pursue things that, um, that are that are great in the eyes of men, I guess, but we miss the heart of the Lord. It's like, you know, sin in the Greek is hamashi or something like that, and it means missing the mark. It doesn't mean sinning and failing. It means you miss the mark. And missing the mark is much more than just, you know, sinning or some rank sin or something like that. It is missing the mark, which is the <coughs> prize of the high calling in Christ. It is the heart of God. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I just, um, uh, and I would say that if, if that spirit works in you, then it works in you, and you don't look down upon somebody that might be pursuing higher things. Even if that's not the Lord, you don't look down on them and say, well, I'm down here, so I'm better. It's, that's the exact opposite. You know, that's violating the very spirit of the thing. You know, we love one another and we support them, but, but we, we know that, that to truly reach his heart is to reach his heart, not to do great things for him. So, um, um, Verse 19, the son of man came eating and drinking, and they said, Behold, a gluttonous man, a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners, but wisdom is justified of her children. 
So I wrote, this generation is like, and see if this matches, because I, I, you know, this generation is like people with expectations and want everything to match up to their understanding. Like children saying, dance, do this. They're, they're like people with expectations and want everything to match up to their understanding, to what the way they know him. <laughs> You ever have your, I type into my iPad and sometimes it, it yeah, yeah, it changes the word. <laughs> my next sentence yeah. says, John Hancock and Jesus came in. <laughs> 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 I'm going, well, I didn't know they hung out, you know. <laughs> but I do know John could sure write, you know what I mean. <laughs> Gosh, let me get that off there. <laughs> that is just insane. <laughs> John and Jesus came in two different manners. One looked devout and the other one looked touchable. John was very devout looking and, and he was a Nazarene, or Nazarite, sorry. Nazarite, he was a Nazarite. Um, and neither were accepted because you, you got to be this way now. It's not just you got to be this way, you know, you dance or mourn, or, but you have to be this way now. And, um, and that, 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 that doesn't just apply to people out there. That applies to us. That applies to um, uh, our, <laughs> our view of people out there. I mean, see, that we can turn this and make it the very same thing in spirit that they're doing. Judge them, you know, and that's not the goal isn't to judge the goal is number one to know the Lord number two to to become purif purified in our motives that um, our hearts are primarily after him and number three not to let that why would that but not to let that um, cause us to judge and to look down and to you know think you know they're stupid when we're 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 more spiritual or whatever, which is doing all the same things that they're doing. There's no, there's absolutely no difference. There's no difference. Um, it is, it's uh, keeping your eyes on the prize and the prize is Jesus. It is, in the end, I don't want to become spiritual. See, I used to want to become spiritual by showing people gifts or people see Jesus in my eyes or something weird, you know, all this stuff. But now I want to be spiritual by being weak. And so instead of having pride over my pride, now I'm going to have pride over my humility. You know. <clears throat> so... Um, John and Jesus, John Hancock and Jesus came in two different ways, devout and touchable, neither were accepted. Jesus was looked upon, down upon for being more focused on the weak and the outcast. Looked down upon for being more focused on the weak and the outcast. But wisdom is justified of her children. And I wrote this after this, and this is for you to judge whether this is a correct, because it may not be. But, but wisdom is justified of her children. A parent's wisdom, a mature person, a parent, a mature person, a parent's wisdom is justified over the ch children's view. Jesus sees there saying, well, you should, you know, dance and da-da-da-da. And Jesus is saying, this wisdom that um, accepts and puts the poor above the famous or the rich or the, you know, this view, this folly of God, this foolish madness called God's wisdom um, is justified even over the, the children's view. They don't, they don't understand. They can't see this. It's not, see, that's not putting them down. It's just saying God's view 
is still going to be held regardless of all the people's view and their reaction toward you. All right. So and then we get into this part. Verse 20. Then began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. Woe unto thee, Chorazin. Uh, woe unto thee, Bethsaida, for, the, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Verse 22, but I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shalt be brought down to hell. It, for if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you, that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. All right, so, so to understand this being thrown in there, doesn't that sound like a completely out of left field sort of deal? But he's already, you have to stay in the context, and the context is he's already told you what the mighty works were. Remember? Verse uh, four and five. And those mighty works is... Um, Let's see. The weak receive their sight. Those who have no strength to walk are able to walk. Um, those who hear, their hearing doesn't work. These are people that have no... Uh, aces up their sleeves. They have no uh, things that's going to help them to get by. They're, they're weak. And, you know, you have to make a clear, and I try to share this from time to time, but you have to make a clear delineation between the weak in this way and the weakness of God. Okay. <clears throat> the weakness in this way is, um, you know, we know this. It says, it says this over and over in the New Testament. God exalts the humble and he brings down the prideful, whatever the wording is. Um, this is the way he operates. You know, I love that one translation. Is this the way God operates? This is how he operates. He doesn't exalt the exalted because they gain that on their own and by their own mischievous ways they have uh, reached something that he would never have led them to and uh, and I realize that for some of y'all this is fairly new angles here but it is um, how was it? I was reading, I think it was in Luke, and the angels were there at Jesus' birth and they were singing. They were singing to shepherds. <laughs> not, not anyone that anybody would believe or be influenced by, no influence. And they said this, glory to God in the high. Glory to God in the highest. And I'm going, that's a baby in, in, a, in a barn. <laughs> it's a baby in a barn. Glory, the Son of God has come in the highest. No, in the truth, that's glory to God in the lowest. And if it wasn't talking about him and just saying to the father, the father is the one who's, who's yeah. brought his son. Glory to God for this. You understand? Glory to God in the lowest. And he that seeks to exalt himself shall be made low. But he that humbles himself shall be exalted. All right, so there is a weakness of, of mankind that God, um, whether we like it or not, he tends toward. Um, I'm thinking of uh, uh, 
1 Corinthians chapter 12, where he says, but the uncomely members get more abundant honor. And we go, well, why would they get it? They're uncomely. They're, they're ugly. It's, it's not, it doesn't make sense. It's foolish, okay? The wife is the weaker vessel, so she should be given honor. Do you, are you following that the, there's a weakness tendency in God toward protecting, to helping, to lifting up? Um, but that's human weakness. In God, his weakness is his wisdom and his power. We read it, 1 Corinthians. It's uh, the, the Jews think that it's supernatural power and the Gentiles think that it's great swelling mysteries that are solved. And he says, but basically Christ crucified, the weakness of God is greater. All right, well, we say the weakness of God is greater because it defeated But that's not, the, that's not the meaning. The weakness of God is greater because the weakness of God is greater. Now, I know. That C says it's folly. It's foolishness. Do you understand? He, he says it there. He says, but it's only foolish to those who, yes. Right. Unless we choose to subject ourselves to that. So he is constrained by us, which makes him weak. Yes. And also by drawing us into that fellowship of oneness, he has made himself vulnerable, which is also another way right. that he has become weak. So I don't know if that fits with No, no, it will. I mean, I think all these angles, I mean, that's, you remember that I said at the very beginning, I really don't want to share this, but I think the Holy Spirit wants to release some seeds that will end up being something greater. I think you're right, and I think, I think just the very nature of love makes us weak. Yes. I mean, it, it's, a, it's, really a, <laughs> it's, it's really a weakener. I mean, it really is a weakener. It weakens you on all sorts of fronts. And in so doing, um, if it is God's love, then it is weak and yet strong. Because it's, love is what? Stronger than death. See? But love, when it comes to Jesus, leads to death for others, for a bride. Okay? So even though it's weak, it's strong. It's stronger than death. But only because that weakness is also the power of God. And that we don't understand because it's the exact opposite. It's the exact opposite of everything we know. It is. It's the exact opposite. Um, years ago, years ago, when my mind began to flip, it began to turn toward the mind, let this mind, when I began to let this mind be in me, which was also in Christ Jesus, who thought it wasn't a big deal to be equal with God, but thought it was even higher to become low for others. And this, when that, this mind began to, to overtake me, I remember one time as I realized that I, I, I was beginning to think this way, I broke down and cried like a baby, and I said, I'm insane. I'm insane. But, not, but I understood what I meant. I say, but I knew that I was insane. I knew that this was the wisdom of God, and it's insanity to the regular mind that everybody has. And I knew that I genuinely now had entered into 
I'm insane and I will be considered insane to this world for the rest of my life because it's foolishness to men. It's the folly of God, the cross, the cross. This is folly. What, what kind of method was this for God to win by losing? How does that work? So we all understand the cross for our salvation, and we all agree with it, but a lot, in a very real way, we agree with it because it makes us win. No, I'm serious. And we don't understand that there is, that the wisdom of God is the power of God. And in that, I'm going to go ahead and say it. In that, for it to be pure, there's not supposed to be any reward at the end. I didn't say there wasn't. I said there's not supposed to be. There, in other words, that's not, that should not be our expectation. But we've made it our expectation. And that's where we've made resurrection greater than the death. See? So, if we had our way, we would wear, instead of a cross, we'd wear a little tomb with a stone rolled away. We'd go, this is the power of God. He came out. No, oh, the power of God, it says, is the cross. Okay. But there in 1 Corinthians, it's not talking about salvation. It's trying to describe God, and it's trying to describe the wisdom of God and the power of God. And, and He's saying that that weakness itself was, was greater than men, was stronger than men. That weakness itself is stronger than men. All right. Well, how can it be stronger than men if we're not expecting a reward? Oh, there's the kicker right there. Now, you think about that one. Then how can it be? You, once you answer that, and you can answer that truthfully in your mind or your heart towards the Lord, you will have learned. You will have made a proper step. But all of us still tend to hold the cross as a stepping stone instead of as the goal. You know, we don't... And an example of that is, of course, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, where it says, buried about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. Well, that's, you know, that's after we're saved. <laughs> What's the point of that? What's the point of that? The wisdom and power of God in action. But see, we're never going to really embrace that <clears throat> until it, we embrace it by the life of it, the life of that. Uh, the resurrection life is slaughtered lamb on a throne. Still scarred, still looks slaughtered, doesn't look victorious, doesn't look like king of kings and lord of lords. Don't you love it? The lamb is king of kings and lord of lords. Don't you love that? The lamb is. You know. Anyway. Um, so what, were the, what are the mighty works spoken of here? Jesus already described them in verses 4 and 5. The weak, is, the weak received sight. That did our, we went through all that. Uh, and then verse 23, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, what's going to happen to it? Brought down. Do you, do you not see a regular thing, even though it totally went off onto this thing, whoa, unto you, and this and that. But he's about to go, oh, Father, you are, you know, your ways are past finding out. You have hidden this stuff. It's the hidden wisdom of God. It's the hidden wisdom of God. And it's flowing perfectly. So, so he uh, ends that part with, um, let's see, let me just make sure of something here. 
It's verse 23, yeah. Okay, so then verse 25, because this finishes up after 24. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O, o Father. I thank thee that this is the way your wisdom is, that you've hidden this from the wise and from the prudent. And you have revealed this to people that are not strong and they're not wise and they don't have it together, but they are. And see, this is not just, okay, so God exalts stupid people. No, that's not what we're saying. <laughs> you know, that's not what we're saying. We're saying that, that those that are in a position, they found out within themselves, you know, I'm not, I don't deserve anything. I don't, I'm, you know, I am weak. I am not going to reach forth my hand and touch the ark. I'm not going to do all the things that everybody is striving to do to become something. I, here it is, I treasure knowing your heart more than I treasure making something in this world, achieving something in this world. I treasure, I genuinely, <laughs> see, you got to genuinely do that, don't you? you got to genuinely, I treasure finding you in the way you want to be found. And that's, so that's what Jesus, remember, that's what he just said in verse 25. Um, at that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, hast revealed them unto babes. And I put hidden and revealed, hidden and revealed, hidden and revealed. Powerful words. Hidden or revealed. He doesn't just reveal. He hides it from, from people that think they know it all or think that, you know, they're going to gain this for their own personal gain. He hides it. He intentionally hides it. We go, well, why can't I know it? Because you, you think that you're wise or prudent. I'm very prudent in the way that I go about this. You know, I may not be wise, but I'm prudent. Head. You know, because we always got to hold on to something and say, this is why God revealed this to me. This is why, because I have, I have a tender heart or I have a heart after God. I mean, honestly, how many of you here have thought I have a heart out and talking about yourself? I have a heart after God. Raise your hand. <laughs> we all have. We all have. And. You know, I believe that we all do love the Lord, and I believe that we're pursuing the Lord as the, in the best way that we know how. And for me to stand up here and to say anything different is madness. It's the wisdom of God. And it says, until we grasp that Capernaum, you have totally missed the mark. I mean, Jesus ministered in Capernaum. Wasn't that where the first wedding, that's his first miracle? Wasn't it? Was that Capernaum? Cana. Okay. Anyway, he was, it was close to Nazareth. And Jesus' estimation is, you are exalted. You think you're exalted to heaven. And I'm telling you, you're nowhere near me. You get that? You're nowhere near me. All right, so that hidden and revealed, the Spirit of God, and like I said, I'm still wading through these very scriptures, but he really was just like jumped off the page, just hidden and revealed, wise or babes. And he didn't say become as a little baby and suck your thumb. <laughs> you know, he said become like one that doesn't know everything become like one that is small and fragile become like one where i will exalt you and and in that state we're supposed to understand we're supposed to find what he's like we were talking about you know weakness and the weakness of god and everything and and uh, the weakness of love and the weakness of this and that. I'm telling you, if you take the time, if you take the time and start going through the scriptures like that, you're going to find 
God's weakness in a million things that we don't even see. We don't see it as weakness. See, we don't see the weakness of it. Maybe that's a better way of saying it. All right, so let me try to finish this up here. Um, <clears throat> All things are delivered unto me of my Father. No man knoweth the Son, but the Father neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomever uh, the Son will reveal him. And I wrote, all, because that's the word, all things are delivered. All in Jesus' mind is what comes from the Father and nothing else. I thank the old Father. All things have been delivered of me, of your heart, of your mind, of your way. See, he's not going, well, he gave me, he gave me jewels. <laughs> he could care. God, the Son, going, oh, I'd like to have some jewels. Um, all in Jesus' mind is what comes from the Father, nothing else. No one knows this weak Father except by revelation. That's what he's talking about, revealing, and that was the context of all of this chapter. But we're not finished yet. We're not finished yet. There's some verses we haven't hit yet. And verse 28, so we start. Come unto me. Isn't it interesting that that comes right after that? He's saying... No man knows the Father except the, the Son, and no man knows the Son except the Father, and no man knows the Father except the Son, and to him to whom I reveal it, come unto me. Next verse, next words. Not out of context. It is, if you want to know the Father, isn't it? It's, 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 tell me if I'm an idiot. That's, it just it didn't, you know. But we, made, we pull that out, and then the true context of that is Jesus is saying, you want to know the Father, come to me. Okay, what, what does that mean? And I'll sit down and teach you? No, listen to this. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come, all that you strength to gain and learn to be weak. Verse 29, the last, next to the last one. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. Learn me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. Learn, he, he says, nobody knows the Father except the Son and him to whom he will reveal it. Come unto me, all ye strivers, all ye laborers, all you strong people. Come unto me and learn me. And what you're going to learn is of the Father. You're going to learn I am weak and lowly of heart. And he is too. He's weak in that way. My father's weak in that way and I am that way. And he says, Verse 30, for my yoke is easy and my burden and light. The way of weakness has no striving. The way of weakness is not a thing that's striving to gain it. It's not laboring and da-da-da-da. It is finding his heart, learning him, and in the process of learning him, your muscles relax. <laughs> Can I put it that way? Oh. You know, your muscles finally relax, and you are... Finding this is what God is like. This is, the, this is the Father. And Jesus said, no man knows him except the Son reveals him. And now he's revealing, come to me and learn of me. And if, you know, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you know me, you'll know the Father. But he's not saying, he's not lifting up himself here. He's saying this is the revelation of the Father. And this revelation you know, will bring, will, will reveal lowliness and meekness of heart. Not just lowliness and meekness, of heart. It'll reveal that is true of God the Father. That God is this way. That God is this way. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time again. And, Lord, I do ask you to forgive my lack of ability to communicate what you tried to share with me, and yet I am still such a rough vessel. 
But you told me that it wouldn't be about my ability to share. Like Paul said, I came not with wisdom of words or strength, but in weakness and in trembling, for I'm determined not to know anything among you but Christ and him crucified. And so I trust that in my lack, in my blindness, in my lameness, in my deafness, that, that somehow your spirit is able to plant seeds, because that's what you told me. You told me to plant these seeds now. You said now. You said tonight. And I, I've obeyed what you said. I know that that's what you wanted tonight. I pray that in the future and in, the, in your timing and your way, you will pull back the veil. You'll pull back the curtain for us to see the God who is back there and understand, Father, that, that God is you and God is Jesus and God is the Holy Spirit and this is how you are. This is your wisdom. This is the way you operate. This is your power. I'm reminded when you were trying to bring Israel out of Egypt, you sent Moses with a rod and he did this miracle and he did that miracle and he did this and that and that. And nothing, nothing brought them closer to the promised land, brought them closer to what you had in your heart until the land died and until its blood was fully displayed in weakness, until its death was eaten by each and every one that got ready to leave. And they left in the power of death, dead land. And it carried them forth beyond the Red Sea. All we see, Father, is the miracle of the water rolling back. We don't see inside of each one of them dead lamb strengthening them for the journey and freeing them from the bondage. All we see is miracles were done and do a miracle for me, Father. But no miracle worked. I ask you, Father, help us to see. Help us to see. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.